Those of you who've been reading and following me for the past couple of years know that I go on and on and on a lot about our inability to agree on what terrorism is. There are hundreds of definitions. Different countries and different organizations look at this particular problem differently. They define it differently. Some include some things, some include other things. And it seems that we're no closer to a universal agreement on what the term is than we ever have been. And I am rather skeptical we will ever get there when it comes to a worldwide consensus on what it means to be a terrorist, what a terrorist group is, what a terrorist activity is, etc, etc, etc. There's another aspect of the use of the word terrorism that is also bothering me quite a bit these days, and that is when states decide to charge people with terrorism, despite the fact that, at least on the surface, there doesn't seem to be a lot of justification for this. Now, I have to admit that I'm not privy to all the details about a person's activities, whether or not there is some kind of a link to, to terrorism or a terrorist group. As someone who worked in security intelligence for 32 years, I know that an awful lot of what we did at the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, or CSIS, was not made public, and therefore, it was sometimes hard to convince people about the advice and warnings we were given, given that the average Canadian simply couldn't see a lot of the stuff that we saw. So I always maintain an open mind on this kind of thing. Nevertheless, I do think that there are instances where the use of the word terrorism by a state is particularly egregious. And there are two recent examples I want to cite, and both of them happen to be taking place in Africa. In fact, Eastern Africa. The first one is one I'm sure you're familiar with. This is a case that's been developing over the past couple of weeks. So a man called Paul Rusesabagina, who was in fact portrayed as the hero in the Hollywood movie about Rwanda's 1994 genocide, I believe the movie was called Hotel Rwanda, has been arrested by Rwandan authorities and charged with terrorism. This is proving to be an interesting case because Mr. Rusesabagina was actually in Dubai when he was picked up and there's a lot of speculation and confusion over whether or not he was kidnapped by Rwandan authorities and brought back or as Rwandan President Paul Kagame says was actually he came, he, he was tricked into coming back. The Rwandans would be a little bit cagey about this one. Nevertheless he has been charged with terrorism and the government is, is kind of I don't know supporting this notion in noting that he once in fact did call for armed resistance to the government and as a result he is a terrorist. He of course is denying it and it's not helping the Rwandan cause from a public image perspective that he's being cut off, he's not getting the assistance he should and that just seems like a bit of a sham. There's no question that Mr. Rusesa Bagina is an opponent of the current president Kagame who's been in power for a very long time which leads one to speculate that in fact he's been charged with terrorism because he has become essentially a pain in the ass for the Rwandan government. They, didn't want, they want to silence him. A similar case is unfolding in Ethiopia, whereby a number of people, uh, including an opposition party leader named Eskinder Nega, he is the leader of the Balderas for Genuine Democracy Party, has also been arrested along with seven of his cohorts and charged with terrorism in Ethiopia. The government claiming that there are violent protests that constitute terrorism. Now, these protests were in the aftermath of the killing of a very, very popular singer-songwriter named Hakalu Hundesa. I apologize if I'm pronouncing his name incorrectly. He was a member of the Oromo group. Now, the Ethiopia is beset with a number of ethnic groups all vying for power. And he was part of this group. And um, basically, the government killed him uh, uh, back in, uh, in June, end of June of this year, June 29th. And so there's been a lot of protests as a result. And ergo, the government's decided that anyone who protests is a terrorist. This is clearly disingenuous at a minimum and uh, disgusting 
at a maximum. It does remind me of the old Soviet days when I used to work in the Cold War, when I was at Communications Security Establishment or CSE, Canada Signals Intelligence Organization. The Soviets used to have this catch-all phrase called, they called it hooliganism. Essentially, anyone who pissed off the Soviets or their, you know, their satellite states in the Warsaw Pact, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, etc. Anyone who got too big for their britches and tried to go against what these regimes were calling for was charged with being a hooligan. I'm not sure what the term was in a Russian. It's a very strange term in English, hooligan. And of course, they'd be either sentenced to long stretches in jail or they'd be sent off to camps in, you know, inner Siberia. Or equally, they would be given a psychotropic drugs. They would be hospitalized because the feeling was that anyone who protested the Soviet Union and its system of government had to be mentally deranged. And hence, these people are treated as mentally ill people. What is happening in Ethiopia and what is happening in Rwanda is no different than what the Soviets did in the 1940s and 1950s, 1960s, etc. And it bothers me that states can get away with this. Now, Rwanda and Ethiopia are not the only two. There's lots of states where I see in the news where someone's been arrested and charged with terrorism. Again, I want to be cautious here. There's no question that in some cases that people who raise uh, alarm about governments or who protest may in fact have some ties to violence, may in fact be advocating the use of violence to overthrow governments, which in fact would be a terrorist offense. Despite the fact we have hundreds of definitions, I think we all agree that any group that seeks to use violence to replace a government, that would fall under the terrorism definition. That's politically motivated violence or ideologically or religious, depending on the group in question. It is therefore important not to negate the possibility that there's a link to terrorism there. But on the other hand, it certainly seems in many cases there is no such link. And what governments are doing is they're simply using the catch-all term terrorism to silence people they don't like, silence people they'd rather not hear from, get those who are perhaps rather influential with other parts of the population that may be equally in opposition to the government to put them away so they cannot influence and recruit and radicalize and get a following. And I think this has been facilitated in recent history by our obsession with terrorism. Again, I will not repeat my ad nauseum arguments about the use of the word war on terrorism since 9-11, but certainly terrorism has become something which A, is real, but B, is not existential, at least not in most parts of the world. And it strikes me that governments such as the one in Rwanda and the one in Ethiopia are taking advantage of our obsession with terrorism and our desire to see it end, our desire to bring in a conclusion to terrorist movements and terrorist activity, and they're using it to apply to opponents, dissidents, those who are against the, the, the current uh, state, the current government. As I said, this is, <laughs> this is dishonest, but it seems to be working. Now, likely, certainly in the case of Rwanda, there's been a lot of voices from the outside threatening sanctions and all kinds of other moves against the Rwandan government if they do not release the, the guy behind Hotel Rwanda, and the same thing's happening in Ethiopia. I don't know how effective this external opposition will be. I sincerely hope these men are released if in fact they are innocent of these types of accusations by the state. But I fear that this is simply the latest examples, the tip of the iceberg, if you will, of states that are going to use our mania over terrorism to shut people up. It's wrong and it has to stop. We have to limit the use of terrorist charges to people who truly are terrorists and belong to terrorist groups like Islamic State, like Al-Qaeda, like Al-Shabaab, like the other hundreds of groups around the world. This misuse of terrorism, like the other misuses of terrorism that I've been railing against, simply has to end. Anyhow, that's my view on what's happening in Rwanda and Ethiopia with respect to these accusations. What do you think? Do you have any experience in either of those countries? Do you agree with my position or perhaps disagree? Do you have information pointing to the fact that these two individuals were in fact truly acting in a manner which would be consistent with how we define terrorism? Drop me a line. You can reach me on email, borealisrisk at gmail.com or on Twitter at borealisaves. You can also find me on LinkedIn and Facebook. If you like this content, want to subscribe, go to my website, borealisthreatenedrisk.com, hit the subscribe button, provide your email address, you'll get a free daily, daily digest of all the blogs, podcasts, all the material, free to your inbox every day. I'd love to hear from you. Feedback on this, as well as ideas for future podcasts and blogs. I'll talk to you again soon. Until then, stay safe.